Hi, I'm Phil Inagaki, and I'm the founder and CEO of Polyera. Polyera is a company which is working on flexible electronics technology in their application into consumer products. So at the heart of Polyera, there is flexible transistor technology. So this is actually a sheet of plastic with flexible transistors on it. Typically, you would see either a silicon wafer or a plate of glass with silicon materials on it, and if you dropped it, it would break, or if you tried to bend it, it would break. So our technology allows electronics to be manufactured in completely new form factors. Where we're particularly interested in applying these technologies right now is in the wearable electronics space. So if you think of products like smart watches or fitness trackers, imagine you had a display which feels for uh, lack of better words right now, let's call it rubber-like. And you could uh, incorporate that into wearable devices. You could now achieve completely new form factors in wearables and have much larger displays, for example. So it goes a lot beyond that, but that, that gives a good sense of what we're doing right now. And, um, we're at the moment literally going all the way from technology to consumer products, so we're developing an end consumer product, which is a wearable device, which we'll bring to the market under our own brand, even though, um, you know, in the early days of the company, we were focused on technology development. I had always been interested in being a high-tech entrepreneur, um, and it's something I knew I wanted to do at some point in my life, and, um, you know, I, I saw a great talk at some point when I was at Princeton, and it was by a successful Princeton entrepreneur, and he made the point that actually starting a company right after college is a great time because you probably don't have a lot of responsibilities you can get. So you should have a high tolerance for risk where it might be a lot harder 10 years later if you're just at the point where you're starting a family, even if you do have some additional experience. And that... um. That really resonated with me, and it was, uh, I think, an inspiring uh, talk. I also had the chance to work with a few entrepreneurs, um, and you know, I did a, my uh, a junior paper with Ed Shaw. I worked my um, sophomore and junior summers for entrepreneurs in startups, and I really loved it. What one of the things I loved most about it is, you know, you get to Princeton. And you can major in anything, and then you can pick any career afterwards. Worked with her, sixties, seventies, or even now. You know, one of my mentors, and he's eighties. They kind of keep that attitude all through life. The world is still so full of possibilities. They still have so many projects they want to do. As I was interviewing at firms, you know, and in consulting and investment banking people that were even ten years into their careers, it seemed that energy of anything being possible really wasn't there and that um, that just convinced me I wanted to be in an entrepreneurial environment as soon as possible. So when uh, I decided to start my own company a little out of Princeton, I decided to look for a technology and I did technology scouting and to find um, the technology that Polyer was founded on, I really did extensive scouting so I um, I talked to a lot of universities, I looked at a lot of invention disclosures, typically universities will have a tech transfer office and they actually have people who, whose job it is to make their inventions visible. Um, so it, it was a, a bit of a, you know, brute force hard work in terms of looking as, as much as I could. Probably, you know, reviewed something like a thousand patents during that time. You know, some of them pretty quick, you know, you scan quickly and in five minutes you can tell it's not interesting. Some of them in more detail. And um, during that time I stumbled across a couple of professors at Northwestern working on flexible electronics. Became really fascinated by the field. I did some deep due diligence on a few technologies that I had selected out of the kind of broad, you know, swath of technologies I looked at. Um, and this one came out to be the leader in my mind. And also what you know, I felt I could be really passionate about. I was really the first full-time person, um, although one of the two professors at Northwestern we licensed technology from was consulting heavily, Antonio Facchetti, who's one of our co-founders. And um, 
now we have about 68 employees spread between a site in Chicago, a site in San Francisco, and a site in Taiwan. Recruiting has always been very important to me. And, you know, I, I think as a founder and CEO, you have to decide how much of your personal time you're going to invest in different aspects of the company. And I believe that, you know, we're not that big yet, 68 employees still, you know, in many ways a small company. But um, enough that recruiting to grow to that point is a big investment, a lot of time. But it's something I believe I need to spend a lot of time in. Um, at the end of the day, it's, you know, tried to say everyone says this, but the value of the company it's, is its people, but you have to decide how much you're really going to live that value. And I look for people who are very passionate about what they do in general and also can be passionate about what we're doing and believe in what we're doing. You know, right now we're working in the wearable space, so wearables as in smartwatches, fitness trackers, etc. It's a very hot space and there could be a lot of people who want to work in it just because it's a hot space but we truly believe in it we have a vision and, and I want people with that kind of, of passion uh, who are going to be able to stick through the good times and the hard times also look obviously for people who are extremely smart but also have manageable egos which <laughs> those two things are not that easy in combination um, but but it's extremely important. I mean, I've met a lot of people who are just so smart, but they think they're even smarter than they are, and that's a big red flag. Um, you know, especially in a small company, you've got kind of an ego quota, and if you go above it, bad things happen. You know, this this may sound simple, but one of the values of the company is audaciousness. So I believe in pursuing goals which are extremely audacious, but because they are so audacious, they're extremely motivating. And then hiring the right people. And I think if you combine objectives which are really exciting with people who are passionate and confident, um, you said the background for success, and then there's a lot of detailed mechanics about leadership and management, but I think that backdrop is just so important. We have a quite interesting and I think a quite good funding story, if I can say so. And one of the things about it is, you know, this company was founded nine years ago working in this field of flexible electronics. At the time, there was already a great deal of excitement. In fact, some companies raising a lot of money with big visions of the future they said would happen three years later. Now, um, there's a lot I didn't know when I started this company, but I knew that it would take a lot longer than three years. At least I knew that I didn't know how long it would take to really commercialize these technologies. Um, so we were really conservative. Ed Chow, our, our chairman, also you know has a lot of experience and, and gave good advice on that ground that sometimes things take longer than you expect. And um, what we did is we decided not to go after VC funding right away. You know, once you start raising VC money, you kind of start a stopwatch and you've got only so much time before you have to create big returns. So we looked for a lot of non-dilutive funding from corporate partnership, things like development fees coming out of R&D program. And um, quite early on, we were able to secure a partnership with one of the largest chemical companies in the world. And... Uh, had a partnership which essentially bought in a few million dollars, which is essentially revenue, in addition to being somewhat conservative with raising equity funding um, and being very careful about what we promised. You know, I, I probably couldn't have raised money in the early days from VCs without making things up or making statements which I didn't have the data to back, and that would have been a very bad decision. Instead, by the time we raised money more aggressively, you know, we, we really had a clear vision and a clear understanding about how to get to market. And so actually, if you look at the history, we've raised about 33 million in equity, but 24 and a half million of that equity was raised in April of 2012 just a little over two years ago. So we're nine years old, but the majority of the funding and the only uh, you know, institutional VC money that's in the company is very fresh. And so it's a 
bit of a unique dynamic where we, we've got a strong history and basis for the company, but we have a lot of runaway. We don't have fatigued investors, uh, which creates a very healthy situation, very healthy and supportive board. We've been uh, doing R&D in this field for nine years. We have a portfolio of patents about probably at this point over 200 patents. So of course there's a core which is a technology, but there's also I think a, a mix of true innovation capabilities with at this point in this took time to build an understanding of mass production and how to take technologies to mass production. So um, maybe I can give a, a bit of a concrete example on that side. You know, I started this company by scouting for uh, inventions in U.S. universities, which arguably still have by far the top innovation in the world. And I've met, you know, I've literally met Nobel Prize winners who make strong statements about inventions that are coming out of their labs and how much potential they have uh, in terms of being commercialized. And you could be a Nobel Prize winner and you could have no clue about real commercialization. You're, you know, you're a brilliant scientist. It doesn't mean you know how to mass produce things in millions of units at an acceptable cost at acceptable yields. It's just a completely different thing. And if you're, you know, it's different if you're doing something like software, you don't run into these issues. But if you're in the physical sciences and you have new technology which is based in the physical sciences, what I see a lot is brilliant innovation in the early days in the universities and, you know, very cool spin outs. But the big gap is how to make that, uh, how to take that to mass production. And I, I worked a lot even with partners in the early days, even big companies which really didn't have a good idea of how to take this new set of flexible electronic technologies to mass production. Um, and the site we built in Taiwan was really to increase our our know-how and our understanding and our partnerships targeted to mass production. You know, the first technology we'll bring to market is truly flexible displays. And at this point in time, almost all display manufacturing is done in East Asia. And, and the truth is if you really want to access that talent and the partnerships, you need a presence in East Asia. So it takes time to build that. You start with the seed of technology and then, you know, you you basically, and at least in your subject matter expertise, forward integrate to some extent, although we're not building factories, we're partnering with people who have factories, and that ties back again to the funding. We don't want to have to raise hundreds of millions of dollars if it's still in the ground. Um, so that's a long answer, but I, I'd say, you know, there's a technology, there's a patents, but then there's the understanding of how to take that to market. Um, and to mass produce that. And now there's a lot more which unfortunately I can't talk about, but we're, we're taking that model even further and building a series of modes. I think, you know, you can't rely too much on just one one magic bullet and hope that that's going to win. You really have to build a series of barriers to competition. I, I'd say the space we're working on and the vision of what we want to achieve in many ways has been, you know, was there at the beginning of the company, which is we wanted to create flexible electronics technologies and revolutionize consumer electronics. However, how much of that we do ourselves and how big our mandate within that vision is as opposed to working on it with partners has expanded uh, significantly. We still work heavily with partners, for example, for manufacturing. And in the future, I suspect there will be more partnerships, but the I think the the biggest change, if any, has been that we will be the first company to put out an end consumer product with our technology on the market. So rather than, for example, partnering with Amazon as the first step and saying, hey, here's a flexible display, you can make a flexible Kindle that rolls up and you can slip in your pocket with our technology, and then that product goes on the market. We are literally taking our own technology and developing a product and bringing it all the way to market. So why are we doing that? Two reasons. One is because, um, you know, I, I, I have a product concept which I believe is a huge opportunity and um, I really believe we can have a major impact in the wearable space and create a huge amount of value. And I'm very passionate about it. The team is very passionate about it. So there's a big opportunity. We want to capture it. The other side to it, truthfully, though, is that working with partners, um, 
while having many positives, can also be very slow. And so I love Amazon. Amazon's a great company. But how long did it take Amazon to launch a smartphone from when they started building that team to when that product shipped to customers? More than four years. And this is over 2010 to 2014 at a time when smartphones are really common and, you know, a ton of companies, some of them, you know, pretty, you know, pretty nondescript Chinese manufacturers can put out a smartphone really quickly. Now, it's probably a lot less cool than the Amazon phone, but I'm just saying, you know, big companies, while really great having all sort doing all sorts of innovative things can also be very slow and and can be very slow when it comes to the adoption of very disruptive technologies and there's a book everyone should read which is the innovators dilemma which talks about you know a lot of these phenomena but um, you know what one of the things I, I I really came to believe is that we could move a lot quicker launching our own product than we could through partnerships. There's also some things which have happened in the last few years which make that possible. So um, the ecosystem, the infrastructure for young companies to develop and launch and manufacture pieces of consumer electronics has evolved dramatically. So some things which, you know, frankly would not have been feasible nine years ago when we, start, we started the company have become um, feasible today. You see this, you see, you know, Companies like Pebble, which had a hugely successful Kickstarter campaign, and then, um, you know, now have literally sold hundreds of thousands of units. Now they don't manufacture that themselves, right? They use contract manufacturers in East Asia. So, I guess you know one of the points is you have to, especially in technology, you have to constantly rechallenge your assumptions. A lot of things that would not have been possible when we started a company are possible now and are better options actually. You know of course I've greatly benefited from having uh, superb mentors and one of the ways in which I was like is I knew I wanted to be a high-tech entrepreneur early on so I sought them out while at Princeton and Princeton is a great place to find mentors and um, I also sought them out in the summer jobs I took so rather than going and doing consulting or investment banking internships I worked for entrepreneurs and startups and um, it allowed me to build relationships with certain individuals which ended up being important in fact uh, you know Ed Chow who was one of my mentors at Princeton uh, and Jean Fo who was uh, an entrepreneur I worked for one of my summers have both helped me um, greatly and in fact were uh, early investors in Polyera and uh, have been mentors throughout my career so far and I think um, you know of course there are specifics you know you, you have a specific challenge you talk to your mentors and they give you advice but I think one of the greatest ways they helped me is and just being a source of inspiration and seeing what they had done with their careers and you know it just made me all the more excited about being an entrepreneur and, and so more than anything them being a source of inspiration I think was a huge benefit to me. You know culture is very important and everyone says that and I think what, what has um, evolved over the years uh, me running the company is that I, I've become more consciously aware of the culture and what my values are I'd say they were there to some extent at the beginning but now I I've kind of vocalized them more concretely and you know I'd say passion and audaciousness very important I've talked about that already but setting goals which are really ambitious working on huge challenges and being very passionate about them. I think, I mean, I guess it's just what I wanted to do, <laughs> and then it's what I did, and then it's what, you know, I think, I think it, you, it really helped with recruiting. I think people saw that, they saw what we were working on, and, and maybe they thought it was a little crazy, but they wanted to give it a try, um, and they saw people were passionate in the company, and, you know, it builds on itself. Uh, Truth-seeking, um, you know, I, I just hate BS, 
and I think it's poison to an organization. And I like you know people who can say what's on their mind, who can communicate their opinions very directly, and who don't play any games. And um, the flip side of that, which is maybe thought about a little less, although I think thought a lot about anyway, is you have to be able to receive that. Um, and that's kind of the two sides of the coin. If people are too sensitive or not receptive to hearing other people's opinions, especially if the leadership is that way, then it will, you know, at some point people are going to start giving their opinions. So it, this is challenging, and I would say if there's something I'm still working on and the organization is still working on, and, and it's something you're always working on, it, is setting this part of culture because it, it, it is something that is. It sounds so simple, but is really, really challenging. Um, and then uh, an atmosphere of collaboration, because what we do is so cross-disciplinary. You know, we have chemists in the company, we have physicists, we have software guys, we have hardware engineers, right? And then everything outside the technical area. I think generally companies are becoming more and more uh, multidisciplinary, and so. People, you know, having people with a uh, spirit of collaboration, even across disciplines, is very important, and it, it it makes it all the more harder to maintain that when you create a culture that's very ambitious and has very high standards. So you've got all these really smart people trying to achieve really huge objectives and working under these really tight deadlines with a huge amount of startup pressure, right? And then somehow they have to try to be nice and respectful and collaborative in that environment. It is challenging, but but that's my dream, right? My dream is having a company where what we're working on is so difficult. It's not the double black diamond; it's a triple black diamond, right? We're going to put out this piece of wearable electronics. It's going to have a new flexible display technology. People have talked about flexible displays for you know years and years, but even the largest companies in the world, like Samsung. And LG and Apple have not put a piece of consumer electronics with a truly flexible displays out. And most of what's come out in the wearable sector has been, let's put it bluntly, not good. So we're, we're going to change all of that. Um, and somehow we're, we're going to still have an environment where under all that pressure people are happy to work with, people are collaborative, people give their opinion in a very straightforward, not political way and then receive it in a very mature way. Yeah, it's challenging, but if we do that, hopefully everyone will want to work for us rather than any other company. Lucky is extremely important, but let, let me generalize a lot, a little about it, and say if you really want to be an entrepreneur and you're ve and you persevere, and maybe it won't be your first startup or your second, but if it's what you want to do and you love it, you diminish. Uh, the control luck has, right? But you have to have that perseverance. In my case, the polyar I started nine years ago, very shortly after graduating from Princeton, and I, I'd say you know I was lucky in the sense that I was able to grow the company, um, always had increases in the valuation of the company in every round of financing. But success has not come super quickly, right? We've been working hard at this for a long time, and what I've seen over the last couple of years is the uh, the context we operate in, you know, when it has to do with consumer electronics, it has to do with interest in wearables, has um, made it so that we have a huge opportunity, a really huge opportunity, and we're in a great position to seize it. But if we hadn't persevered and stuck around, you know, through those first seven years, we wouldn't have been in this position to act on it. So you need luck, uh, and you need to, you need luck for sure. But hopefully, if you play your cards right, you can, you know, wait till you have that that piece of luck that really can propel you to success. Working on bringing a technology to the market, which was so early stage at the point we started the company, and it in itself is very challenging technology. I mean, in the display industry, people will say it takes ten years to take a new kind of display to market, and you know, in some cases, maybe it's been a little quicker, but often that's really true. Um, being able to manage through that. Um, 
is difficult because, like I said early on, you know, if you try to raise money from VCs and you say it'll take us yeah. 10 years to get to market, no one will give you a penny, right? So finding that way to navigate to commercialization with a technology which is very challenging um, was a fundamental difficulty we, we had to solve around. And, um, and I'd say it's the hardest aspect of, of our business versus some other things where you can start and grow something a lot more. You know, in software, for example, I'm not saying software is easy, but in software you can develop a lot quicker, do a beta, go to market, right, very quickly. Um, and that is, you know, very different in the physical sciences. I definitely expect to be CEO of Polyera in five years. And my vision is that we have um, disrupted the wearable space, not only by introducing new technologies, but by, more importantly, introducing completely new user experiences and extremely polished user experiences. And the fact is that technology is not being used for the sake of technology or as a push, but is being used to transform the user experience which consumers have. And there, there's an, an analogy I love to draw, which is that if you look at the iPhone, right, the iPhone launched in 2007, completely disrupted mobile computing. There were smartphones before, right? There were palms, there were all sorts of things. But really, at the center of the user experience of the iPhone is multi-capacitive touch technology, right? That device came out, and it used a more advanced form of touch screens in a way that was extremely polished. So, and that's really, you know, I was not at Apple. I don't have the benefit of having been inside or seeing the conversations, but I've talked to a lot of people who've been there, and they were playing with this touch screen, right? And that inspired new user experiences. But when the iPhone came out, you didn't say, oh, wow, this is like great touch screen technology. You just, you pinched, you swiped, you experienced, and you thought it was magical, right? And so um, I believe that truly flexible displays in the wearable space can have the same disruption on user experience, where when those devices come out, they'll be so much cooler than any wearable currently is, and I want to show that to the world within the next couple of years. Yes, I'm very glad I pursued an entrepreneurial path after Prince and I. I really couldn't imagine doing anything else than being an entrepreneur at this point. And it has, you know, Polyera aside, I love Polyera. I think I could be running it for a very long time and having a ton of fun with it. But let's just say for argument's sake, Polyera didn't exist anymore. Um, you know, the, the experiences I've had, I you know, I, I've got... You know, it's once you become an entrepreneur and you have that experience, like I was saying at the beginning, it just gives you this perspective on the world that anything's possible and that so many things are exciting. And I, I think you can't go back to doing anything else after that. And it's, you know, it's not, you know, there are a lot of other, you know, compelling and, and valuable vocations, but I think... If you've got a little bit of DNA to be an entrepreneur, you should get exposed to it as soon as possible. Because I think if a lot of people, you know, do have that in them, um, and but would only really discover how much fun it is and how it has to be what they're doing if they get exposed to it. And, and so finding some way to get exposed to it early on, I think, is important. No, not no regrets. My name is Phil Ngaki and I'm a Princeton entrepreneur.